Ready? Okay. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Engel. I'm the president of the jury for this uh, defense, and we're here today to hear Rania Abdeldani present her dissertation. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here, and special thanks, of course, to the jury who accepted to evaluate this work and make it all the way to Bordeaux. <laughs> So today I will be presenting my work entitled Guiding the Minds of Tomorrow, Conversational Agents to Train Curiosity and Metacognition in long, uh, Young Learners. So I'll just start with some general context that is motivating the work of this thesis. So today our world is facing yet another transitional period in its history from the political environmental challenges to the AI that is affecting our everyday life in an expansion manner, etc. We are thinking that individuals need to have the relevant set of skills that will help them face these challenges and uh, these uncertainties. And specifically, uh, we're thinking about active learning strategies that will help individuals know how to learn independently and face uncertainty, and also know how to navigate efficiently through larger models of knowledge, uh, such as the ones that AI is giving us access to. It. And today I will be suggesting that in order to do this, maybe promoting curiosity and metacognition is uh, an important skill. So metacognition here meaning uh, the ability to learn and to control one's own uh, learning. Uh, so uh, why this particular focus on curiosity and metacognition? Uh, well, curiosity uh, is uh, usually defined as a pure core feature of our cognition that will facilitate independent learning uh, and discovery through enhancing intrinsic uh, motivation uh, and exploration. And a lot of theories are indeed uh, suggesting this. So, uh, for example, defined like these two that I will be talking uh, more of later, suggesting that curiosity can be a form of intrinsic motivation that um, will arise within the individual themselves when they need to when they recognize a desire to make a specific learning progress and this intrinsic motivation will then lead to uh, acquiring new information and making learning progress which shall, at its turn will form this kind of positive feedback loop in order to motivate even further exploration and making even uh, more learning so these uh, continuous open-ended and intrinsic characteristics of, it, uh, of curiosity uh, are indeed making it very uh, important for the active learning skills that we are uh, looking to promote in today's context. But the big question is, how is it that we become curious and how do we choose what information to be curious about in order to optimize our learning? And of course, different factors uh, can be involved in this, but today I'll be focusing on one specific set of skills that helps individuals reflect on their code, current knowledge status in an accurate manner, identify what missing information they want to uh, pursue, and adopt the uh, relevant information seeking behaviors that will um, put in place in order to uh, achieve their goals. So this constitutes what we call metacognition. And several theories, of course, are now saying that uh, metacognitive judgment is indeed uh, very important. It can amplify or hinder curiosity. So, for example, here, Metcalf and all are suggesting that we'll be mostly curious about skills that we ourselves identify as something that we do not master yet, but almost. So to summarize what I'm saying here is that in order to have the learning strategies that we need in today's context, we need to promote curiosity and metacognition. And for this, we need a dedicated education system. So in order to educate about curiosity, metacognition, encourage independent learning, etc. And even though this is becoming more and more popular, today we are still missing these kinds of um, behaviors in the classrooms. This can, both, uh, can come both from the teacher's side who don't have enough time or resources to put in place such activities, but also from the student's side who tend to have negative perceptions of curiosity, lack of motivation, uh, metacognitive efficiency, etc. So with all this, uh, the general goal of this thesis will be to uh, design and validate some pedagogical material in order to support teachers promote curiosity-driven learning skills. And especially we'll be focusing on one uh, curiosity-driven behavior, which is curious question asking. What we call here curious question asking is questions that will lead to acquiring new knowledge that will uh, serve to um, close a specific knowledge gap or resolve a specific uncertain or puzzling situation. So imagine, for example, this child that will see a rainbow for the first time in their life. They are likely to ask questions such as, 
where does this ball come, come from, or what is it made from, etc. And as you can see, maybe in this example, these curious questions also have this divergent dimension and also seek questions, uh, uh, seek answers of a higher level. And I was, as I was saying earlier, uh, even though besides requiring linguistic skills, uh, formulating divergent curious questions will also require metacognition, as we can see in this model again, where specifically we can see that in order to complete this cycle, we need to know how to become aware of a knowledge gap, how to set some expectations about it, how to seek it efficiently, and then how to evaluate whether or not it's satisfied by evaluating newly acquired information. So in uh, this context, the specific thesis, uh, the specific aim of the thesis, sorry, is to train divergent question asking as a lever for curiosity through the promoting of these specific metacognitive skills. Uh, so to do this, we'll try to leverage new technology. The motivation here is coming from the general observations we see where uh, using computer supported learning systems can actually help metacognition and curiosity through different projects. Just to name a few, for example, the MetaTutor project that uh, trains self-regulated learning through the scaffolding of metacognition, or the KidLearn project that uh, helps foster intrinsic motivation through optimizing learning progress uh, for children, etc. And such projects we see some, have some positive impact on learning, but also on uh, motivation and metacognition. And all of this is becoming even more exciting today with the rise of uh, generative artificial intelligence, and we are all wondering about its potential impact on the educational field. So, for example, uh, its role to uh, to help give students efficient and instant feedback, or uh, generate some personalized learning uh, plans, etc. And of course, we are now uh, naturally we are asking the question of whether they can be a helpful tool to help us in our goal, which is trying divergent and curious question asking behaviors, especially in a context when the literature around generative AI is still a bit, uh, let's say, has mixed potential effects on learning and dimensions such as engagement or empowerment. So in all of this, our specific research questions would be like the following. One will ask of how can we train curious divergent question asking skills? How can we train metacognition and enhance the social perceptions of curiosity? And how can this help us uh, foster curious divergent question asking? We'll also be interested in seeing how can this behavior impact exploration uh, behaviors in children and of course learning. And finally, as I was saying, we'll also uh, be interested in seeing the impact of generative AI in helping us implement these uh, trainings. So to do this, uh, we will start by diving into the literature in cognitive science about around models of curiosity, metacognition, and question asking to come up with some instructional design principles that we want to implement in our trainings. Then through tight collaborations with teachers or by using generative AI, we'll try to um, generate some uh, pedagogical activities for these trainings. We'll then implement them in digital and open uh, Op as open access for teachers to use, and finally investigate their efficiency by uh, including the students aged between 9 and 11. So to pre present all of this, I will start by uh, presenting the design background. Uh, then uh, we'll give you an idea about how our trainings look like and how we explored using uh, GPT-3 uh, to implement these trainings. I will give some highlight results and, of course, some uh, some discussion, limitations, and uh, future perspectives. So, as I said, I, I will start by uh, presenting the curiosity-driven learning framework that served us to uh, identify the training methods that we want to use. We chose this framework because it gives us an oper operational view of curiosity-driven learning. Uh, so this can facilitate our job in finding out what factors we need to focus on in order to put up uh, put in place our trainings. So in this, uh, in this framework, information seeking behaviors will happen after one becomes aware of a dis deficit in their knowledge or what we call uh, becoming aware of a knowledge gap. 
This will happen after encounters with the environment, having some novel, surprising stimuli, etc. Then the transition from identifying a knowledge gap to seeking it will depend on moderators of different, uh, different natures. For example, conceptual knowledge about information seeking behaviors. So uh, is the individual aware of the utility of these behaviors? Are they comfortable with this exercise, etc. Another moderator that can facilitate this transition is the individual's ability to set some expected rewards that they can get once they pursue this knowledge gap and get some information out of it. And then uh, when, uh, <coughs> after the information seeking uh, behavior happens, it will lead to the acquisition of knowledge or making learning progress, uh, learning progress, sorry. So in the case that is of interest for us today is a question ask, uh, information seeking through uh, question asking. This means uh, this will also depend on the individual's ability to formulate well-constructed questions. And finally, to kind of uh, um, maintain this curiosity-driven uh, learning cycle, this will depend on the individual's ability to assess the, the quality of the information that was acquired by comparing it to the expected one and then decided, deciding whether or not about our subsequent behavior. So whether we are satiated or not, or we have new questions, et cetera. So looking at this framework, we identify three big families of factors that uh, we think are crucial in order to facilitate curiosity-driven learning through question asking. One are linguistic factors in order to help, as I said, uh, formulate good, uh, clear, and goal-oriented questions. Two are conceptual metacognitive factors in order to understand what is it the goal of information seeking and how to be comfortable with the exercise, be comfortable with the uncertainty. And three, procedural metacognitive factors. So uh, more specifically, the ability to identify a knowledge gap, to set, expect, to set some realistic expectations about it in order to amplify these feelings of curiosity, then to seek it in an efficient manner, and finally to uh, decide for its situation by uh, evaluating the new information. So after we uh, identified these three factors, what we did is we tried to uh, design some train educational trainings that will target each one of these factors. Starting with the linguistic factors, our training will have, as was seen in the framework, our training will aim to provide linguistic assistance in order to help students formulate knowledge gaps into divergent questions and provide to facilitate this, it will provide cues to make these knowledge gaps explicit for them. So this training, we call it Kids Ask. For the conceptual metacognitive factors, our training will aim to provide declarative knowledge about curiosity and its benefits for learning and try to positivize each image and uh, social perceptions of question asking behaviors. So this will be the, the part one, sorry, of uh, training for Kids Reflect. And finally, for procedural metacognitive factors, we'll uh, have a training that will aim to support identifying knowledge gaps autonomously support formulating guesses about them, support pursuing them in an efficient manner, and finally evaluating newly acquired information to decide for their suggestions. And this will be the second part of our uh, Kids Reflect training. So what did, uh, did these trainings look like? I will start with the Kids Ask training platform that addressed the linguistic factors. So this is a flat platform we developed in order to, for kids to do some reading comprehension tasks. So their uh, goal here, we tell them that their goal is to uh, read texts, try to understand them and ask questions about these texts, divergent questions. And to do this, they will have the help, they will have the help of a pedagogical agent that will give them some specific cues to uh, facilitate the process. So as we identified in the in the framework, the agent will have two uh, will have uh, two goals. So one is to propose a knowledge gap. Uh, so in order to try to make these knowledge gaps explicit to children, we will do this by uh, so this completely will be a piece of information that is tightly related to the text but not actually in it. Uh, and so this will be again the uh, possibility for a knowledge gap that children can relate to. And then the second cue will be a linguistic one, which will be a different uh, a questioning word that they can use in order to trans transform their knowledge gap into a word from the question. 
And here again, the goal of this training is to practice the exercise of formulating a divergent question once a knowledge gap is uh, identified. And then in Kids Get Us, we also had another workspace we call the exploration space. So here the idea is to see how the training, so kids will go here after finishing the training of the version question asking. And here the idea is to see whether how the training will impact ex their exploratory behaviors. So how to do this, uh, so our kids choose a, a topic of their choice. And then we tell them that their goal is to explore as much knowledge about it as possible. And they will do this by uh, viewing some animated videos that they have on this uh, left part of the screen. And in the beginning, they only have three that are available to them and they can choose whenever which one they want to start with. And once they choose a video and watch it, the agent will appear on their right and ask them if they have any questions about this video without giving them any cues or helping them, or helping them in formulating the question. So if they have no questions, the agent has no actions. If they do, it will give them a list of other animated videos that it can propose and that may contain the answer to this question. And they can choose it and then it becomes available in their uh, space on the left right, right part of the screen uh, so that they can uh, look for the answer that they were looking for. So there's a maximum of nine videos to be explored in total and kids were free to uh, end this exploration whenever they wanted. And also did a, th a Please about this theme before and after to see how uh, the exploration helped them gain knowledge about this topic. So if we look back at our research questions, here we are at this part. We're trying to see if our design of kids ask helps train divergent question asking and how this uh, will impact exploration and learning. And to do this, we recruited 51 students, nine, uh, aged between nine and 10 that either had the experimental condition, so the one that I just described, or a control condition when they didn't have any propositional knowledge gaps. So here the agent will only appear to give them a proposition of a questioning word that they can use to think of questions they want. And then we compare the two groups by um, collecting all the questions that they asked during the training and also during the exploration, and we annotated them by hand. Uh, so we were interested in the divergence, whether they were diverging or not, so whether the answer is in the text or not, and their syntactic quality. And here are some results. So for the uh, divergent question asking performance during the training, we saw that the experimental group, so the one with the knowledge gap propositions, had a stronger, so they ended up generating more divergent questions, and it was they in better syntactic quality. And we also, this, uh, we also saw the same results for the exploration, so where they did not have any help from the agent to help them in the process of question asking. Uh, so here we say there's a better training with our experimental condition and a stronger transfer, sorry, of the skill in a new learning context. We also looked at the time spent in exploration and uh, the learning uh, progress they made before and after the exploration. And for the two indicators, we see also that uh, the children who had the experimental uh, condition had a better performance for the two indicators. And this will also correlate to their question asking performance, both during the training and the exploration. And finally, another important result we saw, we tried to assess children's perception of curiosity using the SIEC questionnaire, uh, which is an offline uh, survey to see their social perceptions of curiosity. And here, as you can see, uh, the attitudes towards curiosity was rather low for both conditions, and there was no change before and after the, the, the training on the, uh, for the two conditions. Uh, so moving on to the part one of the Kids Reflect training. So here we'll focus on conceptual metacognitive factors. Uh, and here, as I said, our aim is to give some positive uh, image about curiosity and how it helps learning uh, and try to explain its, uh, yeah, its, its nature. So to do this, we created two animated videos, four minutes long each, and we tried, we projected them in schools and we discussed with children about their thoughts about these. So we had two projections for each 
each video. So for video one, we had explained what is intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, and then introduced curiosity as a type of intrinsic motivation and the benefits of this latter. For the video two, we focus more on the um, effect of curiosity on memory, on attention, and on autonomy and self-confidence. And so this is a glimpse of the video. I'm sorry we didn't have time to, to, to translate it in English yet, so I couldn't give you uh, <laughs> some part of it. But um, yeah, so it was more less like this. <laughs> and uh, moving on to the procedural metacognitive factors, so part two of the kids reflect training. Here, the idea also, as I said, is to train the four metacognitive skills that we identified in the framework. So uh, we had uh, one component, which is also video-based. Here's a, the idea is to um, introduce metacognition and the four skills. So how to identify a knowledge gap, how to set some guesses about it and formulate educated guesses about it, how to seek it efficiently, and uh, finally, how to assess it. And to facilitate remembering these uh, skills, we in the video, we uh, link every each step with a 3D, a 2D character, sorry. And then in the video too, we also linked uh, each, each of these skills to curiosity and gave some examples of how to use each skill in order to regulate uh, and trigger one's curiosity. Uh, for this part of the training, we also had uh, an interactive platform here. It was also a reading comprehension test. And we told uh, children that their goal is to gain new knowledge about this um, text by using their curiosity and metacognition. And to do this, they will have the help of some pedagogical agents that will appear uh, and help guide them for each step. So the agents have this, had the same exact appearance of the ones that they saw during the videos. So here, for example, it will said after reading the text, the first agent, so the identify agent will appear. And here it will explain to the child that their goal is to look for parts of the text that intrigue them because they are even surprising for them or contradicted with something they already know or um, um, yeah, some, something novel, et cetera. And it will have them choose one specific part of the text that they want to explore. Once they do this, then the guess agent will appear. And here it will, help, will guide them into using their previous knowledge about this part of the text in order to formulate some uh, educated guesses rather than random ones in order to try and uh, amplify their curiosity about wanting to know or to resolve this knowledge gap. And once they formulate an educated guess, then the seek agent will appear and will help them uh, formulate a question about this knowledge gap. And finally, the SS agent will appear and here it will give them a list of three pieces of information that may or may not contain their, their answer they're looking for. This is a 50-50% and we'll ask them whether or not they see their, um, their answer and if they have new questions maybe. So this is how the platform looked like. They had eight texts in total to do. So the controller, which is for, um, represents the identify agent, then the detective for the, C, for the guess, then the explorer for the seek, and then another controller for the uh, assess. And so to evaluate these, uh, this training, we recruited 86 students, again, aged between 9 and 11, and we assigned them to either one of three conditions. One with full kids reflect, so they had all the training that I just described, with also kids asked to train the formulation of uh, divergent questions. We had partial kids reflect, where they only have the videos part of the, of the training, and then kids ask. And then no kids reflect, so this will serve us as the con control condition where they only have the kids reflect uh, training. And of course, we had some tests after each step of the training in terms of curiosity perception and uh, ability to ask diverging questions. And we had some measures, intra training measures, in order to assess the accessibility of our trainings. Some of, oh, okay. So to, uh, again, when we look at our research questions, we are at this part, we're trying to figure out whether our training was more efficient in um, training curiosity perception and metacognition and how did this affect uh, divergent question asking behaviors. So some of the results here, I'll start with curiosity perception. So for the purple, it's the initial measure before any training. 
The blue one is after the kids reflect in any of its form, so either full or partial, and then the greenish one is after kids ask. And here, as you can say, for the negative uh, C, uh, for the negative view of curiosity, the scores decreased um, significantly for those who had the kids reflect training in either one of its forms, but especially those who had the full training. And the same uh, tendency we see for the uh, fear of judgment when asking questions in the classroom. And we also saw that these uh, the total SIAC score, um, the enhancement of the score was correlated with the understanding score of the videos that we showed during the training. And moving on to the question asking behaviors, we started by seeing how they benefited from the kids ask training. Uh, so here again, we see the same tendency, better for those who have the kids reflect training and especially those who had all of the training. And for the offline measure also of this measures uh, of diversion question asking. So this is a measure we take, uh, this is a test we take uh, offline, we give them a text and we ask them to generate uh, questions about it. And then we assess the average of the divergence level of these questions. And here again, we see that uh, there is a transfer, uh, there is a bigger enhancement for those who have the whole training. And again, we see that these enhancements were correlated to the performance during the uh, Kids Reflect training, both the videos part and the platform part. So then as an intermediate summary for this part, we saw that kids are, we validated some training ideas for curious diversion question asking, curiosity perception and metacognition. And we saw that curiosity diversion question asking also led to better exploration and learning. Uh, for this, this part, I will uh, present a bit of the work we've been doing around exploring the potential of generative AI to implement such trainings. So the motivation here comes that even though our, with our trainings we saw some positive, uh, some positive results, they are still very hard to use by teachers because, uh, well, all the behaviors displayed by the agents were generated by hand for us. So that's very time costly and effortful. And also it's not easy to transfer it in other learning activities. So we thought we asked the question of what if we automate this process? And we thought, of course, large language models can be a part of this solution. But these are tools that are not still validated pedagogically. And also we know that there is a, a need for knowing at least a bit about prompting strategies in order to have some efficient input. So just telling teachers to use this uh, to create their own trainings is not for now not sufficient. So our end goal in this part will be to design and validate some expert inspired prompting uh, approaches so that we can give teachers some easy to, to use guidelines to create their uh, diversion question asking trainings. And to do this, we explored different methods of prompting uh, 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 prompting strategies, different structures, et cetera, in order to validate a few uh, in the task that we want, which is given an educational test, uh, create us some cues that could help children think of and formulate divergent questions. And we thought first step for this, maybe we try to replicate exactly what we did by hand for the kids ask training. So the good thing here is that this is a strategy that is inspired from literature and also we validated empirically. But however, this is too stringent because it leads to students to think about one specific question, which may not be convenient to all learners. So we thought of creating a new structure we call the open structure. And here the idea is to give more freedom about the kinds of questions that children can um, think of. So instead of giving one specific piece of information as we did for the closed structure, here we give a list of keywords that we think are important for the text and that could lead, lead children to think of different and several knowledge gaps. And then for the linguistic help, we do the same. We just give a questioning words that they can use to formulate these questions. And here the, the, the advantage is that we try to support agentivity and this may correspond more to the learner's zone of personal development. So we explored, as I said, uh, using GPT-3. So this was a work started in 2022 in order to uh, come up with cues 
like following these two structures uh, for the exact same educational tasks that we had in Kids Ask. And after some exploration, we, we ended up using a specific step-by-step -step content approach in a zero extract setting. So uh, it looks like this for the closed structure, for example, a cue will be the vaccine pre pre prevents sorry, disease, the medicine treats it. Q2 is what is the difference? And here it will lead to ask one question, which is what is the difference between vaccine and medicine? For the open structure, we will have a list of keywords. So vaccine, medicine, role. We have also a list of question uh, words, what, how, why, and this can lead to several questions. So what is the role of vaccine? What is the role of medicine, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, once we generated this for different, as I said, for the different education texts we had in Kids Ask, we tried to validate them both in terms of semantic relatedness to the text and also the, their, their divergent level. Uh, so we have three types, some closed structure generated by hand, some cl uh, the closed structure generated by GIP23, and then the open structure generated by GIP23. And for, the bo for both indicators, we had very similar results. Uh, as we can see here. So once we validated these cues, we connected them to the database that is responsible for the uh, agents modeling. And for the open structure, it looked exactly the same as uh, the version of kids ask that I presented earlier. For the open structure, it was just a bit different. Uh, so the cues were uh, a lot of following. And then to test this, with, uh, we recruited again 75 students aged between 9 and 11 in schools here in the Bordeaux area, and we assigned them to either one of the three conditions. So our control condition, which is the cues, closed cues that were generated by hand, then the analog structure uh, conditions, sorry, which are the closed structure by generated by GPT-3, and then the open cues generated by GPT-3. And here you can see that for those who had the closed structure either generated by hand or GPT-3, they had similar, uh, similar performances. So again, we annotated the questions they generated during the training by hand, and we saw if they are divergent or not. However, for those who had open queues, they performed much uh, better. Uh, so they generated more divergent questions. For the syntactic quality of their questions, they were very similar. So here with these results, what we can see is that if used with the appropriate prompting approaches, GPT-3 can be seen as an efficient tool to generate the pedagogical uh, training for divergent question asking, especially when using open structures. And while this is all positive, there are, of course, uh, uh, several uh, limitations and uh, future directions for this work. So first, what about more recent models? As I said, this is, was uh, two years ago. Also, what about reproducibility? So what happens? How can we be sure that teachers will have some good quality uh, of uh, cues? Because we know that these models are not deterministic. So one way to think of this is maybe to teach teachers more about concepts of curiosity and divergent question asking so that they can uh, detect, for example, when the, there is a problem with the output. And very important for us is that we are still, we are lacking real-time feedback for children about the quality of their questions and the type of the questions that they are asking. This is very important because uh, it can enhance their engagement in this task, especially if it's a new task for them. So here are some first steps we are taking that we leveraging again LLMs to uh, try and annotate and annotate the quality of the questions using code books that we developed by hand and using um, and with this uh, method we again this is GPT-3 so two years ago also we managed to have some okay agreements in terms of question complexity and syntactic structure. Uh, between human annotators and GPT-3. So as I said, this is maybe a first step towards using these tools to kind of uh, generate real-time feedback. Uh, so now I move on to the discussion perspectives and future directions. 
So for the results summary with the different uh, studies I showed, uh, what we see is that we can uh, enhance curious diversion question asking skills. And for this, we need to leverage three, we identified three specific skills, which are linguistic question asking skills, curiosity, perception, and metacognition. And we validated some training ideas for these with our training skills and kids reflect. And we also saw that curious divergent question asking led to enhanced exploratory behaviors and learning progress. And another important result we saw here uh, that I didn't talk about is that curiosity trait, right? so as it was reported to us by the guardians of our participants, had actually a mediating effect on the impact of our training, but only in two cases, which was uh, when they had the open structure of kids ask or when they had the kids reflect training. Uh, so in these two cases, the more students who are curious by trait, the more divergent questions they were able to generate. Uh, and I think this could suggest that we need to think of maybe personalization in divergent question asking training. Uh, for example, kids who are more curious about traits seem to benefit more from open, from more agentivity in these trainings, while those who are less curious would benefit more from some close guidance, such as the one we propose in the closed version of Kids Ask. And also, again, with the Kids Reflect training, we highlight maybe again the role of metacognition in uh, reducing the differences in divergent question asking behaviors that are due to um, individual differences. So we're also validating some uh, generative AI prompting approaches to create the ped pedagogical content for curiosity listening activities. So these were expert inspired approaches easily usable and transferable by teachers and they were validated in terms of semantic and linguistic quality divergence level and impact on student question asking behaviors uh, for the limitations so there are quite a few for each of the different trainings especially in terms of design principles uh, and uh, how we were they were implemented but here I will focus more on the general limitations that kind of touch all of our trainings. The major ones are, well, the, all these trainings are short in time, so they last a maximum of two weeks. And all the effects were also measured immediately after the training. So the day after the, we do the intervention, we go back to the school and measure our... So this is, of course, due to logistical and uh, yeah, reasons. We also... Our settings are not very ecological, so even though students were recruited in their schools and did the training in their classroom, it was still the research team that conducted the training, uh, and we did not also transfer the test the transfer of our methods in standard educational activities. So this has, gives us ideas about two complementary possibilities. One is uh, how to think about the transfer of our methods in pedagogical policies. So we can uh, test them on the longer term and uh, see the, if we have some similar impacts and effects. And also the transfer or, uh, in industrial uh, learning technology. So there is an upscale of the method. And again, we can test for longer. Uh, we have like longer use and longer possibilities for testing. For the track one, so the possibilities to transfer our methods in uh, pedagogical settings. Uh, some work in the team has already started to uh, think about this as uh, the idea is that we want to implement the methods in low-tech and offline solutions and in the longer term. We're trying to leverage projects such as the LIAIFE project, which is a project by the French Ministry of Education that puts together researchers and educational stakeholders in order to develop a project together and can give also the opportunity for researchers to put tests on the longer term and conduct their research on in an autonomous manner and um, on a longer time again. <laughs> so here the work is starting to familiarize teachers with the concepts of curiosity and recognition and the methods that we have. It's also trying to co-design co some strategies that they can incorporate in their learning uh, teaching strategies and discussing these uh, these um, yeah, these strategies and the uh, goal, as I said, was, will be to create some general guidelines with examples for teachers to use and be tested on uh, long term. So, for example, a school year. Um, yeah. 
And for the transfer second track, so transfer educational technologies here, there is uh, maybe the aim is to enhance engagement in learning technologies through the implementation of curiosity listing mechanisms. So in order, for example, to avoid the extensive gamification that we usually see in these kinds of tools uh, that are put in place in order to try to enhance engagement. And we are maybe thinking of how we can replace these with more intrinsic factors, such as curiosity, curiosity listing ones. And as a first step for this, we try to leverage collaboration with the French set, startup Evidence Bay. And here the idea is to um, see if we put or if we add a component in the ATS that they are proposing that will make learning progress and learning goals explicit to children, how can that affect their intrinsic motivation in using the app? So this is again a work in progress uh, that we are trying to, to test. Then for the future directions, we also have, have a few, but here, of course, we're um, wondering about the relevance, let's say, of our work in the generative AI age. So one question we are asking is how can generative AI be adapted to support curiosity-driven learning behaviors and metacognition in educational settings today? Because we know that there are some problems with this. And we indeed started to think of uh, a theoretical framework in order to uh, set some alignment between uh, these models and the targeted educational practices. So I can talk uh, in details of, for, for this um, work. We're also wondering about the place of our trainings. Are they useful in generative AI enhanced learning environments? And if not, how to adapt them to? Because, well, we think there is a lot of similarities between question asking skills and prompting skills. So. Um, Maybe uh, our trainings can help on this and this and this um, area. And also, I think that using generative AI to acquire information efficiently requires strong metacognitive skills. For example, how to formulate a goal and clear goal directed and clear prompt so that we can get the information that we want. How we evaluate the uh, output of the model in order to see whether it's helpful or not, and things like that. Uh, so, as a first step for this, so this is a work in progress that I can, um, we put in place a study where the goal is to find empirical evidence for these things I've been talking about. So, metacognition, question asking skills, and how they can facilitate an efficient use of generative AI in learning. So, uh, in this study, we are trying to see the links between these different measures. So, question asking skills, knowledge of cognition, regula regulation of cognition, sorry, et cetera, how they affect the prompting skills and, of course, learning. So, I can talk about this also if you are interested. Thank you. Okay, and we're going to start with the two, um, I'm going to get the terminology wrong, but the, the reviewers, um, who would like to begin? Shall I go? Yeah. Um, yeah, if you prefer. Well, I can start. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I think you reflects very well your incredible work. I really enjoyed reading you. Your uh, uh, very close to the kind of work I'm doing, but also very, very different. So it was really, really interesting. I took a lot of notes. So thank you very much. Um, I will mention some of the questions I actually, um, uh, you probably already read in my reviews. Um, the first one is very uh, low level. So we start with something a little more concrete. So I was wondering why uh, you decided to target this specific age group. And um, if you just could speculate a little bit about uh, what effects you may be finding uh, if you were to uh, maybe target younger children or older children, do you think you will find like same patterns or like what could be the differences? I know you're not necessarily like a developmental psychologist, so I'm more like interesting on, interested in your uh, kind of impressions, uh, yeah. suggestions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, first, so I will start with the first question, uh, which is the choice of the target. Uh, so there are a few reasons for this choice. One is um, 
maybe you are familiar with the work of Postmo. Uh, so the maybe I will have some slides to back up. Hi. Uh, so here. Uh, for the social perceptions of uh, curiosity in this work, for example, we see that uh, beginning the sixth grade, so around 11 years old, the perception of curiosity starts to decrease. So it's a critical age group where they start to form these negative perceptions towards curiosity. And so we thought that this is a good uh, age starting point. Also, from a, from a neuroscience uh, perspective, I think there's some work where we see that this between seven and fifteen, there's like a very uh, it's a critical phase to uh, to train these kinds of to investigate these kinds of training and their efficiency. So, and then there is also why we chose the the, the nine to eleven uh, very practical reasons because uh, in the French schools this is a period of time when they start learning about formulating questions and uh, long, uh, the uh, yeah semantic parts of that um, of that uh, yeah exercise sorry so maybe we thought maybe it is good to go with teachers that uh, are in the same area, so we do not propose trainings that are completely different from what they already doing in the classroom. And uh, yeah, so I think overall there's like between nine and either like older children until 15 or 16, it's a very interesting age group to look at, but because it's easier for us to go also to these, uh, to these classes, we think we chose this. And uh, I think there's maybe with these results, there's uh, some ideas about work in order to investigate uh, yeah, different uh, age groups. So uh, I think maybe older, especially to see how uh, this can, yeah, the impact of the different trainings and especially the developmental trajectory uh, for the link between curiosity and metacognition is something to be uh, to be looked at. I think in the future in this team about speculating of how uh, this looks like for older. Uh, children or younger ones, I um, yeah, I maybe I I think for older children uh, having this because again they are still in the critical phase when they are developing some metacognitive competencies, the trainings could be more effective, can have more uh, impact on their uh on question asking trainings but again it's an age when there is like more resistance let's say to these kinds of interventions so uh yeah i i don't have any um clear let's say projections but i will say that definitely looking into older uh students where there is like a lot of still developmental changes and um, in their metacognition is definitely a very interesting uh, I'd love to see it now. Anything else? I don't know if we want to do one more. Fine, so. Margarita, you have a question? Yes, and um, do you want to finish your questions and then uh, I go on, or do you prefer we uh, we do, yeah, we alternate? I can go with another question. So let's do yeah, it. perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I totally buy your decision of considering divergent questions as your main outcome measure. Um, I also really like the way you somehow um, grounded this choice. Uh, but I'm also wondering whether um, you considered like any alternative measures, like dependent variables you could um, kind of look at. And uh, what do you think, for example, like efficiency of a question or uh, how broad a question is. Um, so, um, yeah, mm. whether you have considered them. Um, so, if you have considered them, why did you decide to choose um, divergent questions in particular? And uh, if you're planning to maybe look at other measures, and if you do, what do you think you may find? Mm. Uh, yeah, so we did actually. Uh try to consider the other uh, dimensions of the questions. So we thought of, uh, so because we are in school settings, we thought of the educational value. So whether or not it is um, a question that is important for the educational context. Uh, and we also thought of the informational gain that could be, um, uh, yeah, could, is 
uh, looked at with the question. Uh, we did look also, yeah, that's all. We did look for these two. And uh, we ended up, I think, going with the divergent one because, again, it lines more with the, because we are seeing this as a lever really for training curiosity. So we thought that this could be more convenient to this uh, kind of angle that we are trying to take. Um, uh, yeah, I think that was the main reason why we, we thought about this. But uh, I think that going with the educational value, for example, is definitely something that we want to consider more and uh, investigate more. Uh, because we had, uh, for example, for the sample, all the samples that I've shown, all the results, when we see questions uh, that are completely, like, well, they are accepted in terms of our coding schemes, they were um, taken off the, the database because they were not uh, relevant to the educational context. For example, when, uh, I don't know, maybe... I don't know if I have an example, but let's say there's a there's an example in my mind, which is we had a text about Mary Curry and her discoveries in science. And one kid was asking about whether or not she was married. Well, while this is a curious question, we did make the choice of limit, not considering these types of questions because of the uh, educational value, let's say, of these. So it was there is kind of a filter already in the our coding scheme. Uh, this matter, yeah. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I actually did not remember this. Uh, um, reading this, it's obviously there because now that you're saying this, it actually rings a bell, but I didn't remember that. Um, this is very interesting. So the 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 this is a question I always get. So I'm just curious to see like how you would react to this. So what do you think is the connection, or do you think there is a connection between like how curious, like how many diversion questions one can generate and actually how good these questions are? Mm -hmm. Thinking about relevance, but also thinking about efficiency in terms of information gain. And you know, like, what is your first impression? I don't think there is any results uh, out there. So, you know, whatever you say, it's gonna be okay. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't I think that in terms of Results, I, I don't think I've ever seen making, so when we talk about, when we have C work about qualities or like the work of taxonomy of questions, when we think of divergent questions, there's already some, some kind of like sanity check, uh, I don't know how to say this, but there's always the relevance part that is taken into consideration. So it's somehow, uh, like we cannot consider divergence without the uh, without the the relevance part of it. So I think maybe in in this in this work we went that direction of uh, because again we are in a formal learning setting. So this is also a very very important dimension dimension for for this. So. Um, okay, maybe I have one last question. Uh, is that okay? That's good. Yeah. Uh, my last question is. Um, you mentioned this at the beginning of your uh, discussion. Um, the the um, trying to think about uh, what would happen if the training was uh, longer, mm -hmm. or you know, like if more somehow I don't know, like time was uh, given to children to kind of play with this um, different platforms. Uh, I'm more interested in like how long lasting do you mm -hmm. think the effects? Because you also mentioned this, they were kind of tested immediately. So do you think the effects would be like longer lasting or if the effects uh, were to fade, like what kind of effects do you think will be more or yeah. longer lasting and what do you think would kind of fade right away? Hmm. I'll definitely think for the for the metacognitive training where there's more, it's more procedural. So we are really training some kind of a, a, a let's say a cycle of learning about applying each Applying it as a each step at a time, maybe I would speculate that that's something that could uh, last longer in, uh, and that's actually even in the observations we. So this is the training where we had two weeks, so it's not long, it's not long. But again, we like after three days or four days, children will still remember. So when we do the reminder of things, they could still remember these. Whether Whereas it's not always the case for the for the just like the question asking training. So I think maybe this um, 
this could be the, the training that will have the longer lasting effect. Again, uh, I'm not sure this is something that we really want to, to see because again, even in literature, uh, training metacognition uh, is not, metacognition is not an easy concept, let's say, and trainings for that last few weeks are not, uh, are very questionable. So, uh, and the work where you see, you will have always, for, for, for the work I know, it will be a school year, for example, in testing impact after at least a semester or two to see how uh, things are things are evolving. So uh, that's, I think, the target that we are trying to, to go for. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Margarita? Yeah, then thank you. I will start by um, thanking for the invitation for reviewing a very interesting PhD uh, manuscript uh, and, and um and congratulating the team. Um, I already sent the uh, elements on the um, on the detailed report of the PhD, and um, uh, it's super interesting for for um, uh, the advancement, uh, not only uh, in relation to curiosity as part of uh, of um, this intrinsic motivation aspect uh, and uh, metacognition, but also in providing uh, ideas on how we can improve. Um, the different uh, technology enhanced learning systems or even general technologies in order to have a, a more guided ways to, uh, to, uh, to support the learners um, uh, the learners process of, uh, of inquiry with through these um, through these tools. Uh, then uh, I, you already integrated uh, these elements that I erased on the, my report the elements on the long term. Then what happens not just on the short term but also on the long term uh, after the, the activity then that was already raised and also that was already asked it uh, just before and uh, but in relation with that um, the elements that I'm still curious about and this is curiosity is not a criticism is not criticism um, is about also uh, about these um, aspects of the task uh, dependency. Um, uh, the community in uh, creativity is uh, is quite um, uh, there's a, uh, a such it's it's quite high consensus on the idea that uh, uh, all aspects related to creativity, then divergent thinking, commercial thinking, but the, also the the elements related to decision making during uh, um, creative problem solving, and these aspects are related to to the task specificity, then the domain. Uh, and uh, also the prior knowledge of uh, of the learners. Then I wanted to know how you are controlling the prior knowledge of your of the participants uh, you're engaging. Then because there's something, <laughs> and maybe I'm wrong on that. But uh, I, uh, while reading, I was thinking uh, there's a kind of an assumption that because they are in the same class, uh, they are quite similar prior knowledge. And then how you're controlling uh, all these aspects um, and also. Also, uh, at which point are you considering the, the task specificity, uh, um, the, the, the results, and how um, in relation to another uh, domain uh, or another type of task uh, of, uh, of inquiry, this could be different results? This is my first question. Thank you. Uh, so for the first question about how do we control for previous knowledge, we just like in the beginning, so the first time we go to schools, we just uh, we have a quiz about all the items that we have in the in the training platform. So the texts are different. So uh, actually, maybe I didn't mention this, but children choose what topic they want to use, uh, they want to work on, and it will be on the same thing. So we uh, for all topics we asked uh, we had a quiz about this and then we controlled for the for the for this learning domain knowledge let's say with, uh, for the different uh, for the different topics that we had in the platform and uh, yeah for the general generalizability uh, I think that uh, for now we are staying really focused on the semantic because we think that this is very important especially for kids of this age. Uh, but uh, we are especially thinking about how could this uh, generalize for things like, for example, learning mathematics or learning about history and things like that. Um, this is something I would say we don't have, we still don't have like very clear ideas about, about how we can do it, but definitely something that um, something that we could use, uh, we could think of, uh, maybe even by leveraging, uh, as I said, like the the um the use in like 
uh, how is this larger scale uh, learning tools and see how where where we offer different subjects and different types of tasks uh, and see maybe I I would don't think that the mechanism of uh, eliciting question asking would be exactly the same. It will be dependent on the type, but maybe the task uh, uh, characteristics. But uh, I think the theory behind will be kind of similar. Yeah. Okay, excellent. There's plenty of uh, of uh, of work to, uh, to that can be done also on the postdoc. Then I'm I think you're you're having a, a high road of opportunities uh, in in relation to that. Uh, the other aspect is relation in uh, divergent thinking components. You're, then you were uh, taking the three main um, divergent thinking components, but some authors uh, consider also elaboration um, as, a, as a component on divergent thinking. Did you consider that or did you exclude for, for a specific reason? Uh, sorry, I, elaboration in... in uh... Yeah, divergent thinking components are usually, yes, uh, fluency, uh, then uh, flexibility, originality, but some authors consider also the uh, the elaboration level. Then at which point and, and which in uh, this type of task will be relevant because it's about uh, uh, how much the kit is not just reusing uh, what you're uh, guiding them to uh, to. Uh, uh, to do, but it's also about how they they elaborate uh, further onto that. Then I don't know if you have considered this aspect, or you did consider maybe a possibility to consider it in the future. Uh, I think we did not think of elaboration yet uh, in that uh, sense. So how? Uh, but maybe in the so the platform with the metacognitive skills is maybe some also that we try from trying to from them and to starting with uh, imagining different hypotheses, then try to elaborate about each one, then in order to select one that is the, they think is the most likable, it's somehow, but this is something we, we do not measure uh, this dimension of any of the inputs that they, they give us. Uh, I think again, we are mostly more, more uh, focused on the, um, uh, on things that are related to curiosity rather than the, and again, a divergent question asking as a, a lever for it, but uh, yeah, I think uh, when because there's also some ideas about seeing how this could affect creativity, and I think maybe in that kind of directions where uh, elaborations could be very important, for example, we will uh, uh, be yeah, something that we think about more uh, concretely. Yeah. And now uh, being creative is about imagine you are discussing with a Vygotskian person, uh, um, uh, post Vygotskian um, uh, um, uh, colleague, and uh, the person is saying, oh, why are you discussing um, um, uh, divergent thinking? Uh, why you're not staying within the zone of proximal development? Are, are you considering uh, your artificial agent as a more knowledgeable other? Sorry, I did not get the question. Why? Yeah, the two aspects is about um, uh, imagine you are discussing with a post Vygotskian person, okay, then someone who is not on the cognitive uh, science uh, perspective, and um, uh, because you are in invoking also Vygotsky and the ZDP. Uh, it's about um, imagine this colleague saying, "Oh, uh, maybe the the, the Z, uh, you are not required to go into divergent thinking because ZDP is already that." Then how you are differentiating um, the operationalization of ZDP and uh, the divergent thinking? Um, then what what will what will be your explanation to uh, to to this person? Oh. Uh, so I think what we are trying to do, maybe again, maybe divergent thinking, we do not have the same definitions of what is divergent thinking, but here the idea of this assistance that we are trying to put in place in the different platforms is try to really get the, the so for example, the cues that we are giving to think of a question is some an incitation to uh, push students who are seeking information that is in the, in the ZPD and uh, give them more like, um, let's say, and talk to them also about how comfortable it is to seek information in their uh, zone of proximal development. So I think it is what we are trying to do maybe in some how is that. So the 
without uh, giving any external, uh, yeah, without, we are trying to give them just like a, the push that they need in order to seek the information that they uh, actually can learn uh, given the uh, educational context that they are in. Yeah. Then, uh, in case um, I, I try to reformulate, um, is about your what you are stating is that um, um, in this operationalization, then divergent thinking is going to a certain point of the space of the ZDP. Yeah, so it's a tool to kind of explore your ZPG. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, on the more knowledgeable other, which is the, the term used by uh, Vygotsky for, to refer to the agent, human agent in, in his epoch, but uh, now uh, that could be also an artificial agent, which is helping uh, to, the, the learner to go through uh, uh, the, the current stage of knowledge to uh, the ZDP. Are you considering your artificial agent, your tools uh, as um, a more knowledgeable other? Uh, I wouldn't, uh, maybe in a sense as it is giving information that uh, helping the, 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 the child think of what is it that they actually are able to learn is uh, somehow have this kind of role, but we didn't systematically think of it as a as uh, we, we are, yeah, we did not think of that like uh, in, from a conceptual uh, and design perspective, uh, this was not, but I think in the end, it is kind of doing the, the this uh, behavior, especially because here, especially in the, in the platform here. So with the metacognitive skills here, the idea is that they are really giving them, they're not giving them just suggestions it's giving them some uh, ways on how to use their what they already know in order to uh, be efficient learners in the, the ZPD. So I think finally we didn't maybe uh, uh, think of it exactly like we are implementing a no, more knowledgeable other in the app, but uh, yeah, we are just, I think at the end we have a similar role. I think it's not only this uh, kind, because in the kids as platform, it was, uh, as I said, again, very uh, punctual and making things explicit rather than helping the child figure things out on their own. And I think here we are more going towards giving them the support they need to make these discoveries anonymously. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a last question, and this I'm, I'm putting on, on, on my shoes. Uh, someone working uh, in pre-service uh, teacher education uh, is about uh, your tool is a tool which is uh, mm, clearly supporting the learner. Uh, what could be the benefit for the teacher? Uh, I think here uh, maybe the idea for, for teachers is to see uh, um, it's a tool they can use to support there these kinds of so curiosity driven learning and metacognition and other things that we're interested in is uh, it's a tool for them in order to understand these concepts and try to apply them in a more autonomous way with their children i think it's um i would say that this tool could be more seen as a way that we control for different insert different uh, factors and see like in a very close way what is happening when we give this exact same of support and uh, we try to see if we can validate these methods or not, these ideas or not, and then uh, this could be translated into just guidelines of what teachers, what we want teachers to be doing during their, um, yeah, just doing their their pedagogical activities. I think. Yeah, uh, and maybe just a minor suggestion in relation to this answer. In this case, it's like uh, supposing the teachers, they are not doing the correct job or they can improve their, their way of doing. Um, uh, it could be very interesting in next um, in next iterations to integrate teachers also on the conception and consider them also as uh, how they can also maybe parameter things or be part of it or have a dashboard of things that could be useful for them. Um, uh, because uh, at least my side, I'm a real good... Uh, I'm quite concerned about tools in which teachers cannot have agency, and mm. uh, and tools advancing in a, in a way in which the teachers uh, have not a word to say, yeah. and uh, and it could be interesting that uh, 
factors, uh, at least the consideration of uh, what could be the teacher's roles and how the teacher who probably knows better about uh, each of the kids um, can also use this information and use it in a very uh, in a flexible way in order not just to be on the side and, uh, and be an observer of what is happening, but also having some action uh, mm. in, the, in the way this can be used in the classroom. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, actually, that is uh, very interesting. And I, I think that's the idea. But again, this is a very, it's, as you can see, it's a, it's a prototyping phase, uh, let's say it's still very early stages. So here, really, the idea, again, it will be a goal of us to uh, help, for example, teachers take ownerships of these models, uh, of these uh, tools that we are suggesting. They can use them on their own in the frequency that they want with, when they think that it's useful during the less, their lesson plans, for example. They say, well, the, maybe this is, for example, when they are introducing some new concept in their classroom, it, they could maybe say, well, this is a good uh, time to, to work on these kinds of um, activities and things like that. So I think there's, again, um, this motivation to include teachers a lot more in this process and uh, uh, just uh, yeah, uh, help them be more autonomous in uh, using these kinds of models, uh, methods maybe, and if computer supported tools. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to turn to um, Jamie to ask some questions. Are you ready? Sure. Um, and I'll start just by saying I I also really enjoyed reading the thesis, yes. and I it was a lot of work that went into it. I was very impressed at how much you've done. And also the presentation, I think, did a really nice job kind of summarizing it and bringing out the big picture. I especially noted uh, contextualizing the importance of the topic was was really well done in the beginning, very clear. Okay. Uh, I'll jump in with a question that I think kind of builds off of what you were, you were just talking about. I was thinking, it, you know, when teachers think about how this would happen in school, what it would look like. And I wonder, like, how are children currently learning how to do all of these different things. So how are they currently developing the skills to ask divergent questions or developing those metacognitive processes and recognition of knowledge gaps? Like, is there anything that's currently happening in schools that you think this would improve on or take the place of? Or do you, from what you have found, is, is this like a big gap of where there's not actually anything happening? Uh, so I think, Maybe I, I, I don't know if I have some data, but I think we like the starting point was uh, some general observations of uh, the lack of some kinds of behaviors, both from the teacher side and also the students. So uh, there is not a lot of things done in order to encourage questioning. And when it is done, it's more low level questioning rather than divergent questioning ones. Uh, so I think that's one of the motivations that are also are. Um, help them see this. But again, when we did not do a lot of observations before intervening in the classroom. So here we didn't uh, we didn't also interview teachers of how they uh, do they uh, put something in place in order to support curiosity or question asking, etc. But again, there are some misconceptions. So what we see, um, for example, when we are administering our trainings, sometimes there is some uh, misconceptions by teachers. So uh, maybe one example in my head is um, mixing up confidence and metacognition and things like that. So I think there are some gap a, a bit, maybe not, uh, again, this is not a, I'm, I don't have any data to uh, rely on, but just general observations and uh, a bit of studies that I know, I think there is still a gap around uh, this and how uh, student, yeah, teachers can help support this, but also students be um, more um, intrinsically motivated to do it. I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah. one or two more. Yeah. Um, two more. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Oh, I have a lot, but I will. Um. So one of the other things I was wondering about is. Kind of the, the skills involved that are being learned through this system and whether they are kind of at that higher level of children thinking like oh what 
what do I not know that I want to know versus kind of like a more formulaic. I feel like kids are so good at gaming the system and figuring out how to do that. And so like, is there something here in the current platforms that can help to avoid students kind of recognizing like what the goal is, what you want, what you're trying to get them to do mm -hmm. and just kind of doing that without really like doing, thinking about things in the way that you want them to and developing the skills. So almost like, is it developing the skills or is it developing kind of just like the tendency to apply rules that are kind of new rules, but, but might not generalize mm -hmm. beyond. And maybe it depends. I know we talked about domain already, like maybe it depends on the domain and, and you would see differences, whether it's taught in language arts and English or math or science. Mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah. Um, I think we did not, we actually maybe did the opposite of that, but if I understand correctly, uh, actually we did tell children about the goal of yeah. uh, of what we are doing from the beginning, and we explain. So the first time we went, the first session we do with children is we explain why who are we and what we are trying to do, and even explain what is question asking, what is divergent question asking, uh, uh, and we want them. To, we are here in order to practice this skill. So it's. Maybe it is something that is um, biasing the results that we see is that we are trying, we are already telling them that this is good and we are here to see if we, we can get like the skill, uh, uh, we can get like big, good performance, let's say, in the skill. So uh, I think, but also the generalization question is very interesting for us because I, uh, we have again, we don't have any data on, on how this is happening, but we have some just qualitative uh, feedback from teachers who are telling them that they are using this in their maths or their um, yeah la large, uh, language learning, uh, and they are seeing that children are more re reactive with these methods after the intervention with us. So I think maybe yeah, we should like elaborate more about how generalizable this skill is. For now, we just, again, we, for the different constraints we had, the transfer, it's just like we went from exploration of text to exploration of videos, which is very narrow. And again, it's not the kinds of activities that they usually have in the classroom. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, maybe again, I think, uh, yeah, having that's why it's really a major limitation. I think the fact that it is very small in time and applied in this um, uh, text, uh, in this uh, yeah, for these activities, because uh, maybe the fact that it is like this, and also we think that there's very accessible the way we present it to them. It's maybe also affecting the results for sure. Okay, my last one. Um, I've always really if you have it figured out about individual differences mm -hmm. and kind of how things might vary. And I thought one of the really interesting findings to think about was the effect on the open platform kind of seeming to be maybe better for the more curious kids. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if I was like interpreting that right. And if you think that maybe it might not be that one platform format is best for all children, and especially I think in a few of the press, there were extreme outliers. Um, and so just kind of thinking about like where kids, what, what different kids might, how kids might differ in ways that might influence the type of platform structure that would be best. And I don't think this is one right about others, but you can, you can yeah. see a few, but, um, um, you know, the ones that were showing like means and you're just like, oh, there's dots way down there. Or would they do better with a different platform or mm. something like that? Yeah. Um, but yeah, just kind of think about those individual differences and, and how you see these platforms potentially providing a more individualized support. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely something, yeah, uh, that we uh, see. So for now, we only had, so we had, uh, uh, we had gender and we had the curiosity trait, but it was as reported by, so the parents uh, reported the curiosity, the curiosity trait. Um, and we saw some differences in how they responded to the, to the, the platform in both its versions and we really as i was saying earlier we saw that it's more correlated to their ability to, to their performance in asking questions when they are uh, in an open condition yeah. when they have more agentivity and choice over what they can ask maybe it's, they can ask more questions about what it's interesting for them etc 
And I think again, and we see it as the, the maybe the opposite when it's mm -hmm. uh, when it's giving them close uh, direction. So this is somehow hinting about the need for individual for, for personalization of these trainings about when is it that they need more support and when uh, and when do they need also like more uh, freedom to explore and. Uh, yeah, I think also uh, maybe something we shouldn't we had or we haven't uh, haven't shown here is that how this is also related to their uh, knowledge about the themes that they are explored. So that's definitely something that will um, should be taken into consideration anyways when we give them training for curiosity because if uh, we give them this topic when they have absolute very little knowledge, then training them to explore would be more, maybe starting with more close guidance is more beneficial for them to get them more at ease with the project and uh, found that the topic, sorry, and uh, uh, more at ease about the exercise of exploring this new theme. Whereas when they already have a lot of knowledge about it, maybe it's uh, more interesting to give them more freedom on how to explore and what kinds of like specific areas that they want to explore more and uh, ask questions about. So uh, yeah, that's that's something that would be interesting also. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So um, thank you for the thank thesis. You. I enjoyed reading the manuscript. Uh, notably, it was uh, good for me for enter. Uh, it helped me a lot to, to enter the community. It was very inspiring. I, I discovered a large video of work I, I didn't know about curiosity. And it's also great that you could uh, make all those uh, experiments uh, quite unique in the real classroom. I only have one question. Um, so first, when I read uh, the manuscript, I, I thought it must be hard to evaluate the curiosity of questions, but this is something you did. But as you said, it was very time consuming. You also noticed that you said you would like to have some real time feedback on mm -hmm. the question quality for the students. Yeah. So my question is, do you think we could use uh, this kind of um, reinforcement learning from student feedback techniques in order to evaluate the quality of a question or like in terms of openness or rank them so that you could uh, first uh, like uh, um, provide uh, probably some feedback and try to uh, try new strategy uh, evaluate the strategy of the cues in order for the, to observe the perhaps the iterative refinement of questions from the students mm -hmm. is it something you would like to you think would be relevant. Yeah, for sure. I think we started a little bit exploring this um, this kind of direction of uh, trying to uh, assess the openness, let's say, of the question and how uh, it um, and the, also the informational gain. Because when in the beginning, when we just started just playing, let's say, with uh, large language models about like the types of questions, it just like saying to the model, is this a divergent question or not, which had no sense because the divergence, divergence level is very fuzzy as a concept either for us as humans, it's very difficult to set the limits of what is divergent, what is not when we are taking, uh, talking about a specific concept. So um, I think for now what we are seeing that this is the very, as I said, this is very early work, but uh, it's, Becoming, I think there's a lot of work right now around using, for example, the T4 in how to, to classify the the level, let's say, of the question in a pyramid like such as the maybe you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. So is it uh, in which part of the pyramid is it? So I start by memory-based questions to questions that are aiming to create something new or some new information. And they are showing some, I don't know if I have some results about this, but they are showing some okay results also so i think it's definitely something promising to explore these in uh, kinds of um yeah different dimensions of openness divergence and things like that but again there's a big problem about the read time uh because uh yeah a lot of tech ethical let's say uh issues about this and putting this directly in a platform where children will interact directly let's say with uh with LLMs is still uh, an issue, so yeah. <laughs> How about um, in, instead of like uh, making them like write the question, which may be hard, like maybe start with uh, suggesting some simple questions 
that they can choose from in order to force them mm. to already influence their uh, yeah skills. i think we did i i'm not sure yeah but i think we did that also like for example that we for the and it uh i don't know if i have the prompting thing here no maybe not uh i think it got like again this is with gpt3 so uh, i'm sure it's very different now uh having them classify questions for example giving them a pool of five questions is something that we uh, we we explored giving them a pool of questions so from we use the database that we had from the children from the actual children so the, the other um experiments that we had and uh we gave them the questions that were so five questions and choose which one is the more interesting for example so the concept of interestingness was not very uh led us to nowhere uh i think we also so we tried the ranking we tried uh so we tried a step by step so what do you think is novel about this question uh compared to this text and so based on that question, how would you weight the, the high, whether or not it's high level or not? I think helping it with step-by-step -step evaluation uh, for sure helps in the, in the past. Okay. If you need to use the uh, individual crowd as annotators, it's just sure that. So yeah. that you get some data that I don't know if they can do it at this edge. This kind of PR system. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, my turn. Thank you so much, Rania. What a wonderful project and a wonderful presentation. Um, and I have just two questions. The second question has two parts. Uh, my first question goes back to something Azura brought up before. Um, I know you're a cognitive scientist more than developmental psychologist, but this is about children and about education. So of course it has to reflect developmental research. And I'm curious about the underlying assumption well, I'd love you to elaborate on the underlying assumption that children at age seven are bad question askers, because the research shows that three-year-olds are very good question askers. Um, and even though it's not your area of research, I totally get that. You must have some thoughts or, or some conceptual framework for, for explaining or imagining, speculating on what happens to their skill. We know something about what might be happening to their disposition to ask questions in a school setting, and we refer to some of that research. But what's the underlying assumption about why you have to teach them how to do something they were already good at? Yeah. I think uh, so. We were, uh, we started really from data or observation we had from schools rather than from homes, for example. And I think that's very different. So maybe even, as you said, there's a disposition when they are in school. So maybe even kids who are good question askers in school, this could be a bit different. I, I don't, uh, so we really focus on the, on the, the school condition. And I think, again, it's a lot, whole different. A lot of factors that can um, affect the way that they they uh, don't do this, or at least not enough. I think there's a lot of work also where just even the disposition of how they are facing, like the even in circles or just in rows, can affect this. So the, there's like st starting the social perceptions of being fearful that, uh, for example, when I ask a question in the classroom, my peers will think I'm stupid or I'm stubborn or uh, uh, things like that. I think these are some assumptions that uh, we saw here in, in schools that starts to form really at this age. And even though they are maybe a lot of kids that they do have questions and we do not ask them in a social environment such as a classroom. Uh, and that's why one thing we we had, um, as I said, one goal is that to to positive I try to change this concept and even our data from from the from the first ever study uh, we saw that their reflections around curiosity were rather uh, rather at least like average uh, so they associated it more with negative things rather than like oh it's very cool like for example we didn't see things like when what you showed oh that's how i learn and uh if i don't if i'm not curious i will never learn anything so uh yeah i think that's one. okay i have another question um it's sort of two part but i'll ask them both at once so one thing that really interests me is the is your emphasis in your method 
on teaching children the educational value of curiosity. And at least in the United States, there are a lot of children in our school system who don't care about the educational value of their experience. They have to go to school and they have to get through it. And telling them that they'll get better at school by doing something that they're not intrinsically motivated to do um, doesn't help because they don't share the goal of educational success. Did you see a difference in terms of kids? And it goes back a little bit, not exactly individual differences, but differences between communities of children or groups of children in terms of their receptiveness to the idea that this is good just because it will make you good at school? Uh, I think, again, this is a very just purely observation. So we did go to different schools in this area and where we interestingly where we started we went to what we called here in france a rep school so these are kids with low uh social what is it called social yes yeah yes <laughs> and i actually did notice that um the reception of this intervention was more uh, they were kids were more exciting about excited about doing the training and they were very happy that they learned something new and these were kids that I think would never this maybe was the first time they hear about curiosity or asking questions and these are kids maybe even that at home they don't have the opportunity to ask questions so I think they were very more receptive and we did not do a comparison between the different schools that we went to, but I think it could be interesting to, to see this. Or so, yeah, I think here it's um, mostly it was okay accepted, like in the Bordeaux area here. Um, usually we did not see at least uh, children that they just refused the method and refused to understand uh, or said no, uh, this is a bad thing or not. But they were at least during the intervention, again, we do not know how they can apply this afterwards in their, in their life at school or, or outside. Uh, but they were engaging in, for example, when we discussed with them after like watching a video together, they will ask questions, they will be, they were showed interest in what we are um, yeah, showing them. So I think Generally, we didn't have a refusal. Well, I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I would say that we did see more enthusiasm where we went to more uh, difficult, let's say, schools. Really yeah. Interesting. Okay, so that sort of answers my second question, but I'll ask it in the mm -hmm. second part of the question. So you talked a lot in that vein about the learning rewards of being curious. But of course, a lot of models of curiosity assume that it's the learning, it's it's the satisfying the information gap that's the reward. Did it did you ever think of trying to measure the internal reward feeling of yes. just getting the information to the question? Yeah, I think that's a very good question and very important uh, point of uh, do we because here again in the different tests that we we do afterwards we see that they asking questions but are they asking them because they did recognize new gaps, or are they asking them because, well, that's that's what they're asking them to do, or that's what they're supposed to do. And I think there are different, uh, we thought about um, uh, some measures that we can uh, we can implement to have this. So we tried the metacognitive efficiency index, which is not exactly that, but uh, um, we saw this, but I think definitely the ability maybe uh, Assessing how are their ability to identify a knowledge gap when they are faced to one and it is very interesting. Uh, I think we just had motivation measures. So, and we saw in all the studies that I, uh, I showed, they were more uh, intrinsically motivated then. So, we used the Valeron scale, which is intrinsic, intrinsic motivation, and our motivation. And we saw that motivation was more intrinsic, but again, that could, there is a bias maybe in that data so uh, I don't know how we can maybe yeah I will be very <laughs> curious about if you have any ideas about that <laughs> Thank you. and yeah just one question we, we I think we discussed one time maybe about using the exploration underwater exploration uh, game as a maybe a, like a way to assess comfort with uncertainty as an indicator also of uh of that but uh, yeah. <laughs> the 
That's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, time for priorities and Helene to ask. Caffeine maybe first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's right. I'm bad. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm out of it. You so so it. Yeah. Okay. So thank you right now for work and this presentation. So just a few words. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Obedience D, which is a company who has been working with Rania uh, through this thesis. And um, what we do at Evidence being uh, three words. You know that, kind of good for the audience. Uh, we are an um, adaptive learning edtech company who helps the K-12 students to master the fundamentals in literacy and numeracy, and which helps the um, teachers to help the student in this personalization and this mastery. So um, at the very beginning of the story, we had uh, also, and first of all, um, we are evidence-D because it means evidence-based education. So everything is comes from research. First of all, the contents that we have been developing with researchers on cognitive science, also the personalization we have been working with uh, Yadiv and flowers from the beginning. And the third part, and this is what uh, Hania's work represents, is the uh, um, part for uh, accompanying the learning path of the students because uh, everything is not in the contents. And Hania insisted a lot about that. <laughs> you can have good contents, but uh, it's not all about uh, the assessment and the contents. And uh, so the um, work with Rania helped us to uh, enhance this part, third part of uh, what we provide, uh, is to complete uh, the learning path of the students, for example, with dashboards, with uh, uh, rewards, with, and also with this uh, question of the curious question. So uh, it has been a very interesting uh, uh, work with you, Rania, as you know, and uh, we are, very, as you said, also, um, it's a work in progress, and little by little, we go uh, on on this third part of the, the project, so thank you. So uh, just before I, I say a few words about Rania, just uh, let me uh, thank again uh, the members of the jury for coming. That's really amazing to 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 have you all here. And um, uh, I mean, uh, you've been an inspiration uh, for some of us uh, in a number of projects, and for some of you for a number of years. So that's really great to have you here. Um, I'd like also to to say thank you to Ellen for the co supervision. Uh, it's really great to uh, to to work with you and uh, and to and and to uh, to co-supervise a PhD student. I think we have very complementary ways to give feedback and uh, and and guidance. And and I guess probably uh, if the, the backgrounds that we have that are very complementary, we are not collaborating. We would probably not be able to uh, to do projects uh, such as Rania's PhD. So I think it's great. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen. Uh, uh, that, that that's really great. Um, I'd like to thank also uh, the Evidence Bay Company and also Catherine in particular, uh, uh, who is the head of the research uh, uh, and of the content development at, at, the, at the company, uh, who funded a, a large part of the PhD. And that was particularly relevant to us because it allows to, to, to develop a project that is really at, at the start uh, grounded in fundamental cognitive science research, but that we try to progressively get into more applied research, research that, that matters at the conceptual level uh, for educational uh, uh, and societal issues, but not only like trying to, to stay uh, in a kind of academic experiment in the schools, but thinking about in the future, how this kind of work could uh, actually connect to actual educational intervention at that large dis disseminated into a, a large scale. Uh, and for example, there are ongoing projects in terms of uh, trying to, to reuse some of the components uh, of metacognitive training in uh, other contexts, for example, uh, for software that help children learn mathematics. So that, that's, I think, enriching a lot uh, this kind of work. And finally, let me thank uh, the, the whole uh, Flowers teams and collaborators, because as you've seen, there is a lot of experimental work 
in this PhD, and uh, and you've seen many co-authors. Uh, a number of them are students, uh, actually, in the team and also be on the team. And, and uh, their contribution has, has been tremendously useful uh, to to achieve all those results, uh, uh, starting uh, uh, from. Uh, uh, going into the classroom and collecting the data uh, uh, up to uh, uh, daily, daily uh, help, such as, for example, helping into the organization of today's event. So I won't mention the names of everyone, but there are many. And thank you very much to everyone in the class. Um, and so now, Hania, so congratulations <laughs> for, for the work and presentation. It was amazing. Uh, but I knew it, it was going to be amazing. So that's not a surprise. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to say that. When we uh, uh, recruited Rania, I remember when we had interviewed her. So we had this kind of project in mind. It was still quite speculative, and 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 we wanted to do a project uh, where uh, we wanted to 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 leverage some uh, uh, fundamental cognitive science principle to have impact into classroom, and to do that through developing technologies that may not be so trivial to develop uh, to, to to manage to do that. And so it required basically to find someone who could have all the expertise and in practice it's, it's it's very rare to find people with with all these expertise and and uh, and so Rania came from one of these domains and Rania initially actually I'm I'm glad that, that Susan uh, you said uh, uh, you assumed uh, that that uh, Rania was a cognitive scientist um, she is today but but at the at the beginning of the PhD she was coming from an engineering uh, uh, training and uh, yeah. and. <laughs> and, 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 and she was really great. She had done an amazing project when she presented to us. Both it was very clear and she was already showing great intellectual humility. humility. But this was also a bet to, to recruit uh, and to start the project because there is so much to learn uh, about cognitive science and all those kind of fuzzy concepts where every, every person using those words, they mean something different. Uh, so how to navigate in, in, in that space. And I would say that, uh, so we often say that intellectual humility and curiosity are closely linked. And I guess that thanks to your intellectual humility and curiosity, you are incredibly efficient at going right away into the literature, reading the art papers, understanding and synthesizing uh, very fast uh, to the point that you really become an expert. And I, I have to say that more recently, uh, there are a number of topics, uh, especially at, at the crossroad of generative AI, and education, where uh, thanks to your efficiency to go and navigating into the literature, I, I discovered and learned a number of things that you didn't know and you pointed me. I, I was thinking about speculative ideas and then Hania said, oh, there is a paper about that. <laughs> so so that, that, that's, really, uh, that's really cool. Um, and, um, and, and so, yeah, so it, it, it really showed uh, uh, progressively, uh, I would say learning progress, an amazing learning progress during the PhD where where uh, Rania got to a point that uh, she got all the skills to be uh, the, the, the great researcher she is today. Like, first of all, and that's very important, asking great scientific questions and also questions that matter to society, which means that Rania is, is uh, always trying to give meaning to the work she's doing. And, and uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's not work that's done for the academic purpose and then you get with the paper, but it's something that at some point is aimed to have an actual impact uh, for, for, for children, for teachers also, and, and that, that's very valuable. Uh, and, and then there is all the whole work about uh, designing the protocol, designing the tools. Actually, Rania programmed all the interfaces and all, all those stuff, so that's a lot of work. Going into the schools and, uh, and then uh, just in a, in a few days after the experiment, uh, coming up already with the graphs and here are the results, and, uh, and then in a few weeks, then the paper is written. And uh, I have to say that uh, both Ellen and myself, in general, we have relatively little work to do uh, <laughs> because the paper is already like in a state that that could go directly to the conference. So so we try to find things to <laughs> to, to improve, but uh, it's sometimes hard because it's it's good from the start, uh, but but it's good for us also. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so 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 that's amazing. And maybe I, I don't know if if I, I think there are some some people uh, that maybe from your family here or outside the academia, but but maybe sometimes you may have heard Rania uh, not feeling too self confident or uh, like saying the work. Okay, I'm not so sure it's great. Uh, uh, I, I would say I mean the work is really great. You need to know that. But it's again it's intellectual humility and and the capability to actually 
laser point the small limitations that are here and here and here and and uh, of course they are there but that's that's the point of research and uh, uh, even the best uh, scientific project they have a number of limitations uh, and that's the way we, we progress so 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 yeah so uh, in reality uh, I've, I've I've really seen many many uh, excellent PhD students in my career and I can really say that Rene is among the top 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 students so mm -hmm. at the international level so this is what you need to know. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, just as to conclude, I said the, the, the scientific discussion we had uh, uh, is very similar to the discussion we, we, had, we had during the PhD. It's like a discussion between scientific colleagues. So I guess you're already like, like, uh, like any uh, senior scientist. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm really curious to see your next project. Probably we're going to learn a lot from you. Uh, so thanks again for all the amazing work. and. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the next project. Thank you. Let's see if the function is very, very difficult for me to, to do best of <laughs> that. So, um, first, I would like to thank everyone uh, for each uh, specific role as a uh, uh, jury member or uh, supporter of uh, Rania, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I would like to, um, to have a special uh, thanks uh, for uh, Pierre-Yves and Rania. Thank you to give me the opportunity to work with you. Uh, it was an amazing adventure for me because it was uh, the first time where I work uh, at the beginning of, um, of a research project, project of, about uh, the design and uh, the assessment of uh, uh, curiosity uh, driven uh, technology. Before I, I, uh, I started to work with some uh, people of the team, but not uh, from the beginning to the end of the, of the project. So uh, it was a wonderful uh, adventure with uh, with your two, <laughs> both of them, uh, with each one of you. And um, I, I hope that we will have a future opportunity to, uh, to work together uh, due to the, the good fun uh, we have to work together. And uh, I think that um, you will have um, a wonderful and um, probably uh, very positive uh, experience in your uh, postdoc uh, in Germany. And um, as you say, the, the PhD uh, of Chloe uh, is based on your work. So uh, I think that uh, it would be uh, wonderful to, to follow uh, with you uh, your project. And um, finally, uh, I would like, because I think that uh, it's the most important in the in the everyday life. Uh, I would like to, to finish with uh, the best wish uh, regarding your personal uh, accomplishment with uh, people who, who matter for you. Yeah. So at this point in time, uh, uh, we, the jury, uh, we stay in this room. And so everyone uh, is asked to go uh, outside for uh, the, the time we deliberate. And then we'll call you back. Uh, Should I sub the Zoom for oh, the yes. public? Uh, yeah. yeah. For the 